This uh, topic here on uh, man entrepreneurship in difficult times, I know it's a lot more topical than any of us might like. <laughs> and unfortunately, a little too close to home for me. I was, uh, in addition to teaching here, I spent the fourth quarter raising money for a clean tech company. With the combination of the economy tanking and oil going down to $40 a barrel, it's not something I'd recommend anybody ever do again. It gave me a little bit of feel of sort of what's it like out there in the, re you know, in the real world at this point. And I think we've got a great panel assembled here. And the reason I can tell it was a great panel is nothing against the business school, but none of the people here are MBAs. So I know they're all here <laughs> because they must be great for this panel as opposed to ties to the business school. So Manjal, let me just uh, first give you a uh, short bio of him. He is currently the uh, co-founder and CEO of Like.com, and he'll talk a little bit about what that company does in a second. He, this is his uh, going through his second difficult cycle. He was also an entrepreneur in 2000, 2000, 2001, and 2002, and we'll talk a little bit about the contrast between that period and this period. Uh, has actually been a serial entrepreneur involved in starting a number of companies in the Internet and technology space, and also has been very active in the entrepreneurial community. He has a uh, master's from Stanford here in computer science and then an undergrad from uh, UC San Diego. Maybe, Manjal, maybe just as a start, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what Like.com is, when the company got started, and sort of what the model is for the company. Sure. Um, so Like.com is a visual search engine. Um, we actually look inside the photograph at the color, shape, and pattern of an item and try to help you find other items that are similar. And we've applied it to shopping. So <laughs> if you think about it, you don't uh, – Like.com is really the first search engine where you can submit a picture as your query and say, you know, this is the handbag I like. Show me other similar-looking handbags. And you don't need that for shopping for digital cameras because Canon SD900 gets you exactly what you want. But I'm trying to find somebody with a loud pattern here or kind of a unique pattern. I can't find any. But you know, even if you take this more mundane pattern here of a, a blue cross shirt, I always insult somebody with this. But um, no matter how many words you use to describe kind of blue striped uh, shirt, you're not going to get that in a text search engine. You're not going to get this exact shirt back. You'll get one with bigger stripes or smaller stripes. And, and so kind of what we found is that um, there really is a need in the market for a, a search engine in which you can submit a photo and hence uh, search aesthetics much better. And Like.com started in 2004. Uh, it's now over $20 million in revenues, up from about uh, $1 million in 2007. So 2007, 2008 grew pretty dramatically. Uh, we've raised about $50 million in financing with the last tranche um, coming in August of uh, 2008, so just before the market crashed. So that's our situation. Great. Uh, maybe you can tell me a little bit about you started the company in 2004 in good times. Right. What was your first signal that the economy was changing, how, and how did, what kind of actions did you take at that time? Um, I think, uh, so we started it in, either it was changing for the better, you mean? For the better and then or, for the or, worse. For the worst, yeah. So, um, you know, 2004 was the year that um, I kind of started working on the technology for Like.com and just started, you know, investing and said, you know what, the cycle is kind of moving upwards. Let's get a small team. Let's work on the tech. Let's grow the core, <coughs> unique value proposition of the company. My last company that I had built, we really didn't have a strong, unique value proposition. I kind of said to myself, the second time around, I want to make sure I have a tech differentiation that can't be easily replicated. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first kind of investing into what, you know, so when things got bad, I still had that piece mm -hmm. in place. The second thing that we did as we kind of scaled up the business is, you know, I wasn't equity sense, I wasn't um, r really sensitive to how much dilution I took. You know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are, and they're like, I don't want to sell too much of my company, and that works if you can kind of start and exit before um, the bubble bursts, but there's always a cycle, and, and I actually think the most equity-sensitive entrepreneurs pay a tax when the bubble bursts because they either took on debt instead of equity or they didn't take on enough cash. So part of the things that we tried to do ahead of time was kind of, you know, there's this entrepreneur who once told me this, and I eat the appetizers when they're being passed around, not when you're hungry. And, and just kind of, you know, if, if somebody's want to give you money, man, take it. Um, and then don't spend it, which is a, a lesson I didn't do the first time that I, I'm doing now, but we, we can talk more about that mm -hmm. in a second. And then things turning, uh, you know, I don't know that we saw this any more than everybody else. You know, they said, oh, you know, you raised it in August, you were so smart, you saw this whole thing coming. Yeah, that's why my personal 401k is down 50%, you know, <laughs> I saw it coming. So, um, you know, I, I don't think we really saw it. This one hit so hard and so fast 
that, um, you know, it, it, we didn't say a comment, frankly. But what was the point where you said, I'm changing what our plan is for the business? What was the point where you kind of said, okay, I've now recognized what's going on, life is different, our, some, things have to change as a result? That was pretty fast. As soon as we started seeing things decelerate and even September, October, you know, most of us this time around, frankly, stepped on the brakes much faster than we did before. Mm -hmm. We stopped all hiring. We stopped, you know, looking at different things. Um, we stopped extra initiatives we didn't need. We figured out how to get to profitability faster, you know, things like that. We just, and that was literally September, October, November versus I remember last time it was like, you know, I still remember the CNBC article, you know, things where they're like, it's going to be a deep V. We're going to come right out of this. And then, oh, no, it's going to be a U, and then it might be a W. And, you know, in the end, it was just an L, right? And, and, and so this time, you know, you know or, or this time it's even worse. It's like a Y, you know. It's like, and, and I just think that um, this time we just didn't assume that. We said, well, let's, let's hit the brakes harder than we need to. And, you know, obviously those guys um, advertised hitting the brakes, and, and that made it easier for everybody else, frankly, to do it. Have you made any changes in your strategy or business model, or have most of your adjustments been what I would call more tactical and cash management oriented? You know, this, uh, this deceleration in the market has actually even changed the macro market itself. So what we found is, you know, first of all, we got customers going out of business left, right, and center. Like.com sells leads to retailers, right? So we charge them for every click from Like.com that we send a potential buyer over. And many of our retailers are going out of business. You know, there's, you know, people who are filing bankruptcy left, right, and center, Circuit City and others, um, on the hard good side, but just everywhere. What we're seeing on the, um, the other strategy changes that we've made, though, is our retailers have shifted their focus. So they said, you know what, I don't want to buy as many leads, but I want them higher quality now. So there's, there's actually shifts, if you will, in the octane of the gasoline we're selling. We were selling 87 octane, and now we're selling... You know, we're reformulating to sell them 91 octane because that's kind of all they want to buy right now. So you're actually, I think this downturn for many businesses isn't just let me manage more cash or make sure I have enough. I think it's actually requiring you to tweak your UVP, your value proposition, a little bit here and there. I mean, as a result of that, have you sort of focused on a different type of customer at all? Have you found opportunities that you said, gee, this was not an opportunity in good times, but frankly, this is an opportunity for us in bad times? <coughs> yeah. It's <laughs> a short answer. I, I, um, there's some of those that I kind of won't share because we think they're pretty <laughs> proprietary. There's some unique things we've been trying for years that wouldn't work, and now that they're working. Um, and there's some M and A's actually. You know, we had the fortune of raising 30 million bucks in August, and so we're sitting on a lot of cash. And one of my fellow entrepreneurs took a different strategy. He said, "I have enough money to make this last, even if I break even four years from now." And at like.com, we took a different approach. We said, no, let's figure out how we make sure we break even this year. And then the question becomes, what do you do with all that cash if you're going to break even this year? And the answer is, we're going to buy people. You know, we're gonna, there are sites that we've wanted to buy that were too expensive that we couldn't afford. And I think as this year progresses, some of those are going to become really, really cheap. And um, you know, that's the right time to buy them. So. Inside the company, I mean, if you were going from a model where you said, gee, we didn't have to be as much conserving cash to one where you said, now i got to start breaking even right away. Has that dictated either a different culture inside the company or a different type of manager that you need on your senior team? Um, so first, I, I, learning from the last startup, you, you basically can architect a company that doesn't worry about cash and then try to make it worry about cash. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's like you need a complete brain transplant. <laughs> you need to fire the CEO, fire the exec team, rebuild it entirely. Given our experience from last time, this time I was like, you know, uh, for example, the peak employee count at my last company, Andale, um, in 2000, early 2000, was like 120 people, which then we had to take back down to 30 people before we broke even and then grew back in India uh, to 200 plus, but had to do, you know, 170 in India and 30 here. We never actually grew the U.S. This time around, literally like .com's peak employee count is 35 people. Like.com's revenues are larger than even my last company became after five, six years, already in year two of the revenue scale, we got there bigger. So a lot of it is doing things kind of the right way the first time. Mm -hmm. I think it's really hard to re-architect your cost structure, your internal um, attitudes. 
you know, your, your kind of corporate culture. I think it's very, very difficult. You have to kind of be cheap up front. So. Mm -hmm. What's your internal operating assumption for how long we're going to be in this Y, L, U, whatever shape it is that you're, that you're picking in? Kind of, what's your internal assumptions about that? I think we're here for a while. <laughs> I mean, does this feel different yeah. than 2001, 2002? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think this is, you know, clearly more global, clearly larger scale, um, clearly more systemic. Um, that was a sector-based failure in 2001, 2002. It was like you know, the Internet boom kind of came and went. Yes, there was a macro recession, but it was fairly, you know, it wasn't anything of the scale we're seeing now. So um, our assumption is this is you know, at least two, three, maybe even four years. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's kind of my argument of, you know, how do you break even at all costs, mm -hmm. no matter what? Because you don't want to use your, you don't want to just assume it's going to be two years. I know I've heard, hearing VCs talk to that, like, you're okay as long as you have 18 months. And, you know, they said the same thing, actually, in September. It was like, as long as you have 18 months from September, you're okay. As long as you have 18 months from now, you're okay. Well, I, I just wouldn't make any assumptions about that. The best companies are the ones that are profitable and, and, you know, it may be hard to get profitable, actually. We've even had to move ours out because we thought it was going to be sooner. But, you know, the macro environment is degrading faster than we thought. But still, you just kind of keep trying to reel it back in as fast as you can. Yeah, I mean, you had mentioned sort of actually using this downturn in sort of what, you're, what is a relatively good cash position. Right. So to actually con possibly do some consolidations. Do you have any st strategic goals for how you want to position the company for two or three years from now, given the constraints that you have right now? Um, you know, actually, we've not lost our ambition. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still believe Like.com has the opportunity to build the best soft goods shopping search engine, period. And soft goods sales on the web have exceeded hard goods sales. They're larger. Think of Stanford Mall. Nine of ten stores are soft goods. So, yes, the initial Internet was in hard goods, which is books, movies, DVDs, electronics. But actually, I believe selling clothing, shoes, handbags, watches, jewelry is a bigger long-term market. I think we can literally own that entire market. Um, and so we're actually making investments in certain areas now that we weren't investing in before just to kind of prepare us so that, you know, whenever the sky's clear, you know, I still think this is a company we can sell for a lot of money or a company we can IPO and continue onward. Uh -huh. um, and we just need to kind of prepare for that day by investing now. Is there any you know, specific advice you might have? I mean, we have a pretty big mix in this audience in here, as I can tell, from on people who look like they're probably starting companies to those who are out there coping with this to some probably who are probably investors in here. So, you know, maybe targeting towards those who are sort of in similar situation that you are, who are sort of managing in this advi environment. Any specific advice you might have that we haven't covered already? Um, well, actually, I just want to show heads. How many people here are in a startup right now? And how many people want to start a company? I guess it's kind of half and half. So uh, one piece of advice for those wanting to start one. I had a group of about 15 friends who were basically about the same age as I was when I started my first company, which was I was 26. Um, and, um, and all of them, their first companies went bankrupt. So all 15. Um, and all of them basically, except for three, got back on the horse and tried again. And... The three who didn't end up being BD managers, directors somewhere, and today basically, yeah, they make a good salary, but they really have not hit the jackpot in any way financially. The other 12 started again, and in every single case, those 12 have made at least $5 million minimum, and the largest, I think, has made over 120. Um, and what's interesting is the ones who started their next company the soonest, meaning their first one failed the fastest, so the ones that started their next company in 01 actually have made the most money. <laughs> And so there's this almost perfect correlation between when they start and the ones who started their next company and waited until 07, as an example, are not doing nearly as well uh, or haven't made nearly as much. So kind of the net is it doesn't matter if your first one fails. It doesn't matter what happens to it. Just get back and try again. And actually, if you can get one started in a downturn, yes, it's a tougher crucible, but fundamentally those seem to be better companies and you get to kind of build them longer and when the next, you know, macroeconomic upturn comes, you basically get to sell them for more money. So uh, that's one. For those who are in a startup, um, you know, the first thing is you got to make sure if, if you're going to, if you have a chance of running out of cash, you can't run out of cash and you have to cut. And most people are just in denial. They're just like, oh, I'm going to turn the corner here and so I just need to manage down to that million low point and then I'll come back up. 
And, and so I don't have to take action now. I have plenty of cash to kind of ride me through it. And I would just say, what's going to happen is, you know, it's like I call it the Alice in Wonderland problem. I mean, you're going to chase the rabbit down the hole. You're going to think this is your break-even point, and, and your cash will go here, and you'll kind of cross over here. But what will happen is your revenues may fall faster than you think, and then suddenly you'll need even more cash. So just be paranoid and break even as fast as you can. And and some people think, hey, if I got to cut all these people and I got to go from 200 to 30, God, what do I got left? And we cut to the bone and we can never go below the bone. There's no such thing as bone in cutting. That's what I've learned. <laughs> you literally can cut a company down to seven people or 15 people like Nextag did in 2002 and, I, and sell it with their private placement they did for $1.2 billion five years later. It, it can happen. It does happen. I have another example of opinions where that happened. I mean, I can give you 20 examples. So break even at all costs, no matter how painful you think it is. That's great. Let's uh, move on to Bob Walters. Bob is certainly no stranger to difficult situations. Uh, he was started his career off as a uh, fighter pilot in the, uh, I assume it's in the Air Force? Marine Corps. Or, or in the Marine Corps, even tougher. Uh, <laughs> and then has been... Uh, a very successful entrepreneur in the uh, security f security field, currently is the uh, CEO of Untangled.com, but also has had several successful startups along the way that he's been either general manager of or a major contributor to. So maybe, Bob, if, you know, just as a start, maybe tell us a little bit about what Untangled does, your business model, how it got started, and how the company's financed. Sure. Uh, I can't imagine a more different deal uh, than like.com than untangle.com, first of all, um, and its circumstances. Uh, untangle.com got uh, started on a shoestring by two Carnegie Mellon guys. They built the company for like three years with just three people, um, all with this dream of being able to more efficiently and more cheaply deliver software to small business. And anybody that's run a small business, by software I mean network, core networking, security, um, and the like. And anybody that's run a small business knows just how difficult it is to even get your email up and keep it reliable and running. Um, so that was the vision. A uh, lot of toiling there, a lot of uh, self-funding and so on. And uh, the company got its break basically when, um, when it got its venture funding. And that's when I joined and that's when some mistakes started. Um, which I'll talk about, um, that, that look like uh, vivid technicolor mistakes now, but certainly didn't, uh, didn't then. But our promise, uh, our basic thing that most people talk to us about is we're an open source company, and so we give away 80% of our solution for free in perpetuity, including upgrades and, and all of that. Um, that. That action was not one of our mistakes. That resulted in like a 15x increase in the velocity of our business in every metric, every single metric. Um, and that continues. We're now one of the most successful open source projects in the world. Um, we, we are approaching 100 users. Uh, I'm sorry, we are approaching a million users. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be fired. Well, I'd be fired by Munjal standards for about five different reasons. But, um, but uh, you know, so we're, we're doing pretty well in this downturn. But to visualize the market that we serve, you know, we serve 10-person law firms. We serve middle schools, especially private middle schools, quite frankly, or, or um, secondary schools, especially private secondary schools. Mm -hmm. um, we service auto repair shops. We have an undertaker. We have a bunch of homes. We have, this is the true small business. We focus on 10 to 100 employee businesses a notoriously difficult market to reach, impossible to get funded in this environment, just impossible. In fact, I told my VCs I'm not even going to try for an outside round. It's a total waste of my time in, because we're an off-the-beaten-track deal. You know, we're not a dot-com in the search engine space with panache. You know, we're an off-the-beaten-track deal. So our path from its inception has been, and we don't have a key technology differenti differentiator per se, other than our patented GUI and our method for delivery and, you know, and our open source nature. There's nobody like us in the world. So that's why I say we're a very different company on a very different trajectory than what was just described. Well, maybe talk a little bit about your customer base 
and what's been the change in your customer base w your willingness to basically just pay for the add-ons as opposed to just take the sure. free part of what you're offering? Sure. We've seen as this uh, market uh, turns south, more and more adoption of our free product and less, le less and less adoption of our paid product. Gee, that's, uh, that's hard to, that's hard to uh, believe. But the main thing that we saw and the thing that necessitated a uh, drastic uh, change in business plan was that our channel evaporated. So the channel for small business is like mom and pop shops. It's like George next door who does IT for six or ten uh, uh, different end user firms. And George is funded on a shoestring. George, had to, George is not VC funded. He doesn't have access to capital. And if he needs capital at all, guess what it is? Debt. That channel evaporated. I mean, in um, Q4 uh, of last year, just quite recently, it, it evaporated. It held on for a while because these people are tenacious. You know, that, that, that's how they make the li their living. And um, so probably some self-funding, but the channel evaporated. And so we had to accelerate our plan to go Internet direct. And that's, that's the path we're on. That's the path we always were going to be on. But we wanted to start with a channel, which is a more traditional way to uh, service this market, and then go Internet direct. We don't have the luxury of building the channel any further than we have. So we are in the process of swinging the ship. Half the, half the executive team is gone. Half the rest is new because it's an acceleration. Um, so that our company now has three executives, including me. That's a big change. And um, we're down from 42 people to 19. So um, that's, that's kind of what we saw. So what it, you know, Mun Munjaw was talking about how he basically changed his, you know, the, the uh, goal for the company. He said, we got to break even now. I'm just curious, how are you thinking about cash management, you know, compared to long-term growth and your ability to access first capital and how you're balancing all that. Yeah. So we're growing well, so we're about to close a, an inside round Series C um, with our, with our uh, current investors. And my position is that this, uh, that this situation will never end. Now, we all know it will. But I don't see – this is – not only is this multi-sector and international, but it's debt-based and not equity-based. And, you know, equities fly on emotion. Debt is real. You know, debt is real money. And um, so we basically have a plan to uh, break even early next year. And via whatever means I have to take, we are going to break even um, early next year. Uh, based on where our starting point, uh, you know, there's just no way to, to do it any sooner than that. Or I would. Our, our user base would collapse and our community would collapse if we if we get uh, take too desperate a means, and then we might as well not even play the game anymore, or we play it as a very different. The founders just take the thing over, and you know it's an open source project. What you know, you mentioned that you cut the company down, changed part of the management team. For this environment, I mean, what what is kind of the characteristics of the managers that you've hired over the next year, and the type of mentality and culture you're trying to build in the company right now? Yeah, well. Um, <laughs> My managers, you know, maybe because I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but I tend to I tend to like to hire Midwestern managers, partially because of their work ethic and their their frugality. You know, just their basic core values. I find so. Please don't take offense to that. Uh, you buy coastal people. Um, A lot of immigrants here. So uh, so that's uh, or beyond the coast. So so that's um, you know that's that's been a part of of the scene uh, at my companies from its from the get-go the new thing is the web quite frankly and it's not enough when you're gonna when you're gonna accelerate a plan and really turn the company on a dime it's not enough for an existing management team to know the web they have to be expert at the web they have to they have to be able to operate on the web and operate with Omniture or whatever web analytics mm -hmm. you're using from muscle reflex not from I'm gonna think through this this product, they had to—they have to have seen the patterns before. So um, we hired into that into that uh, skill set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were mentioning, you know, kind of your view of the, 
you know, things are going to be bad till proven otherwise. Yeah. And you were also, you know, like Munjob, you know, a manager, you know, you know, through the last bubble. Yeah. What were, I'm just curious, what were the lessons from the last bubble that you applied to this time, and what's different this time? Um, I entered my last project well into the, well past the bubble. I, I helped uh, Kleiner and, and a couple other VCs sort of repurpose the, the, the bubble startup. We, we missed getting out by like one month. It's one of these tear-jerking, you know, horrible things that somebody should make a movie or a miniseries about. But um, So I, I went into my, my follow-on gig. You, you know, it was already the economy was in the toilet and everything. So right from start, uh, you know, I was able to just manage into that into that uh, environment pretty easily. Um, this one we started in, I started at least, with this project in, in pretty reasonably good times. And this thing came upon us. But the, the other thing that I would say to you um, entrepreneurs in training and, and about to be entrepreneurs and, and even others, um, don't rely just on Silicon Valley for your intel about things. Um, for example, I attended, I, was, I think I was on a panel of a, a banking conference uh, on Wall Street uh, in 2007. And one of the key speeches that was given there was a rather lengthy and very detailed exposition of just how bad this crash was going to be. And this was in 2007. I came back and shared that in Silicon Valley, and it was like, nah, we're insulated <laughs> You know, we, we, VC money's insulated. It's on these long year cycles and, and all that stuff. So as an entrepreneur, you know, be sure to take in, uh, take in multiple sources because there were sources available. I'm Monday morning quarterbacking. There were sources available that predicted this quantitatively in fine detail. And ironically, those sources were on Wall Street, you know, the place where the, the epicenter uh, of it. Jim Gatz is a partner at Sequoia, so when everyone was talking about Silicon Valley, I know, Jim, everyone was looking at you. Uh, Sequoia is really, you know, really the, you know, one of the flagship venture firms here in the Valley. Uh, Jim's focus is on enterprise systems, mobile software, and consumer technologies. Uh, before joining Sequoia in uh, 2004, he was a partner at another very good venture firm here in the Valley, uh, Excel Partners, and prior to that was on the entrepreneur and company side with a number of different companies. And Jim a, a, has a, a master's from Stanford, so at least we have two of the, th two of the three with Stanford connections here in the, uh, in the panel. Uh, Jim, you know, maybe we should start off with, Munjal had, Jal had uh, referenced kind of that famous uh, Sequoia presentation mm. you know, from uh, the fall of this year, where basically was kind of the first venture firm really to sound the alarm that life is different and companies need to adjust. So maybe you talk a little bit about the advice that you're giving to entrepreneurs about what people need to do to really survive and thrive in this environment. Yeah. I'm just curious, how many people saw the presentation on the web somewhere? <laughs> oh, good percentage. Uh, well, look, that was an opportunity for us to get our entrepreneurs together as a group. There's always an opportunity to get empathy from one another and, and to build strength and confidence on the position that we took as an investor, and it was an opportunity to reflect on what happened in 2000 and 2001 and talk about best practices. And candidly, the response that we've received from our portfolio has been surprisingly good. And, uh, you know, we can talk a lot about what folks didn't do, but candidly, we're stunned. Uh, the actions that were taken in the fall, not just in the Sequoia portfolio, but kind of across the board in the entrepreneurial community, we are incredibly pleased with. Literally 60% of our portfolio is cash flow positive right now which was certainly not the case last September when we began to think about pulling together the entrepreneurs. And part of that was cuts. Part of that was additional focus on the business model. But uh, a very pleasing and encouraging data point on entrepreneurship and the ability to build a company even in this environment. I mean, how are you advising your company sort of on the trade-off between, you know, just ca you know, get, get positive, manage your cash, make it last, versus investments for the future. And I know that varies company to company, but how are you asking people to think about that trade-off? Well, look, it varies. We have companies that are in the development stage where we just literally funded them in the last three to six months, and they're mm -hmm. going to spend the next year, year and a half, developing 
a 1-0 product. Yeah. There's no expectation that they're going to be cash flow positive during that time period. But Mujal made an incredibly important point. This environment, from a recruiting point of view, is something that I would characterize as unprecedented. You know, you're able to pull in times 10 or times 20 talent. These are individuals that are capable when motivated and amped up of producing as much as 10 or 20 individuals. And a year ago, two years ago, it was very difficult to do. Today, it's now possible. Mm -hmm. And we encourage them to think about efficiency and to treat every dollar as if it was their last. But in the end, we recognize that many of our young portfolio companies won't be cash flow positive for some time. Yeah. How have you changed, you know, within Sequoia, your capital allocation? We'll reserve more, for sure. When we make a Series A investment, the historical notion was there's lots of access uh, to follow-on capital, and that's no longer true. We think the environment in the venture community is going to change. We'll see a culling of the venture folks. We, we describe the environment in venture as Malthusian. There are too many people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an overfunded environment. I know as I sit and talk to a group of entrepreneurs, this is not – uh, a data point that all of you want to hear, but it does create too many young companies going after the same set of customers, which eventually does become a problem. And I think one of the things that will come out of this environment, you'll have fewer higher quality companies. And candidly, I think the companies that are started in this environment and survive are likely to endure into the next decade or two. Our very best investments historically were started in downturns. Cisco, Oracle, I, I would suggest just for a moment that even Google was started during the bubble. Uh, at least when they really got commercial, mm -hmm. was in the 2001 time frame, where it was a very difficult time. And what are, you know, what are the characteristics of investments you're making now? And I think it would be interesting to contrast that versus the characteristics of investments you were making, say, a year or two years ago. Well, I think the entrepreneurs are a lot more grounded. Uh, focus on capital efficiency. The, the crisp description of the unique value proposition and how we're going to eventually ring the cash register is right up front. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've made four investments in the last three months, and we probably expect to continue on that pace over the course of the next year. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's materially changed, but the focus on the economic value proposition in this environment and what's really going to hunt, I think mean, Moonjal gave a couple of good examples. We're beginning to see just now, in the last couple of months, companies that have been created with an idea that the backdrop from an economic point of view is going to look like it does today for the next two, three, four years. And then, you know, since we have a number of people in this room who are considering starting companies, particularly the students in this room, I mean, what advice would you have for the entrepreneurs who are looking to start a company 2009, 2010? Well, it's a wonderful time. Ignore the newspaper, ignore CNN, CNBC, it is probably one of the very best time periods to start a new company. I think Mujal, with his description of his company and his experience, is very accurate. I mean, I would argue that the partners of Sequoia and many people in the venture industry feel better about the environment we're currently in than the one we just exited. And if you uh, have a passion, a pain point, an idea, and the kind of energy that it requires to build a company, I'd encourage you to move forward. Do not let the fear of the current environment stop you. There are lots of talented uh, engineers, marketing <coughs> folks that are now available. And up and down Sand Hill Road, right down the street, there's plenty of folks with capital. There's a story that is formulating that, that goes like this. Tier 3 and Tier 4 funds are not out. Uh, and Tier 1 funds are having major LP pressure to show results. It's also it kind of pushes them to deploy great capital. So they're getting pushed out of early stage investing. What are your thoughts on that? There is a widespread belief that if you look at the 10-year rolling returns of venture that have finally dropped off 98 and 99, that the numbers are horrible and that the whole asset class on a 10-year basis has done very poorly. Now, there are exceptions, people who sold YouTube, et cetera, but the, um, what you're going to see is a massive reduction in the number of funds out there because – the whole asset class has shown really crappy results, and you have all your big, um, you can probably say this part better than me, Jim, but, you know, your big LPs in the world, um, you know, Stanford, Harvard, endowments, et cetera, are immensely illiquid. <laughs> and, they're endow you know, their public portfolio has fallen by 50%. They haven't marked their private portfolio down, but they know it's fallen by that or more. And they are just not going to put as much money into this asset class as they have. And for a while, they're going to put none, or they're even selling. I think Harvard sold its 
venture portfolio right. for 50 cents on the dollar or something like that or some I mean it, so there's going to be less capital there's going to be less investments there's going to be less firms I mean now whether they're going upstream or not I, I don't know in terms of yeah, company size I think a couple comments I think the LP environment has changed if you read about the endowments many are down 20 30 40 percent and during the tech bubble maybe the portion of their portfolio that was private equity and venture specific was down materially but it turns out their real estate their bond portfolio has not been impacted the way the correlation that we're currently seeing has impacted the LP community. That is going to change the perspective as they rebalance their portfolio on where they put their dollars. And I certainly think we're going to see a culling of both private equity and venture towards managers that have performed over the last decade. That said, uh, this notion of putting money to work, I mean, that was kind of a uh, historical phenomenon. I, I don't see a lot of that. I don't, in fact, if anything, I see hunkering down. And some firms are worried about their ability to raise their next fund and, and candidly are investing less right now and being uh, much more tight-fisted. And, and arguably, I haven't seen a handful of firms make an investment in the last six months. And I'm sure that will change, but I'm not seeing people spraying money around in this environment. Yeah, there, there are firms like Summit and TA that specialize in later stage investment opportunities. They typically invest in profitable or cash flow positive companies, and they invest with check sizes in the 10 to $100 million range. That, that certainly is captured by your comments, but I don't see many early stage venture firms at this point in time, at least our co-investors pursuing that. Certainly Summit, TA, TCV, the growth folks. I had one follow-up to the question that was up there. If you want to join a startup right now, you might want to try what I call the Mehul strategy. So Mehul is this guy who came to work for us who basically um, sent his resume in, was working at um, Salesforce, had no relevant experience to what we were looking for, not really related. Wanted to work real bad, sent his resume. I didn't. I was like, this isn't relevant. I didn't follow up. Showed up with a bottle of wine. You know, left it. I was busy in a meeting. I looked at it. I'm like, you know, wine searcher. Oh, okay, it's 50 bucks. He spent real money. You know, looked at his resume. Still, I was like, this isn't a good fit. He came back. He's like, I'll work for free. He had a wife who was pregnant who was going to have their kid in three months, mind you, and his wife didn't work. And he's like, I'll work for free. I want to work here really bad. I just want a much bigger equity stake if I'm going to work for free to do this. I was like, okay, fine. You know, and we tried it for three months uh, or six months. I forget what it was. And anyway, as long as <laughs> to make a long story short, he basically is now one of our key lieutenants. He um, he's a director at the company. He runs a large swath of the company. We obviously pay him, but he's ended up with a very big uh, equity stake as a result of kind of him taking that initial risk. So, what you may want to do is figure out what startups you want to be at. You know, right now, what you want to do is learn. Even if you can't start your own, you want to see something work, or even if it doesn't work. And you, can, you don't have to sell your services for nothing. You can sell them for a larger equity stake in return. But that's how you can get into places that otherwise basically can't. Because if they hire you, they basically get to convert some of their equity into cash, and they can't do that right now. They can't raise money. They can't convert their equity into cash. And you give them a mechanism to do that. So. Question for Bob. So you're focused on serving small and medium-sized businesses. Small and small. And, and you said that uh, you are, you know, you really drastically reduce your headcount. So what is the most important area of the company that you're focusing on uh, in this sort of small customers? Engineering. Uh, you know, we have a community that does a lot of our marketing for us. Sales were trans we've we've in the past seven months moved from twenty percent of our transactions done on our website to ninety nine point six percent of our transactions. How did we do that? Well whether you're a channel partner or not, if you don't want to transact on our website, you can't be a, you can't play with us anymore. That is a, that is an acute change of business model, um, not without risk, but simply we don't have a business unless unless we do that. So I think that that our most important function is engineering, and our second most important function is our web team uh, to reduce friction, to make sure that the online experience is is excellent to make sure that Google points to us, um, all of which is, I think, happening reasonably well. Um, I'm with a small medical device firm, and we just raised a small round from private investors about $2 million. We're looking to raise another round in about 9 to 12 months, so probably 5 to 10 million. Are you seeing the lead times uh, grow in terms of talking to VCs, or you know, how or, or should you really kind of wait until you're closer to actually need the money, given what's happening in the market? 
despite what you hear about lead times, if a venture firm is interested in moving forward, they will move with uh, quickness and uh, esprit de corps. You're going to find groups are going to be binary. Either it drags on three, four, five, six weeks. If a group's ready to move forward, our process is usually less than a month from first meeting until not only do we have a term sheet, but you're usually well into the close process. I, you should hear from both Bob and Wendell on that, but I think that's consistent. Yeah, well, first of all, I like your esprit de corps um, comment. Um, the, uh, I think Jim hit, hit, you know, hit the nail on the head from my perspective, from the entrepreneur's perspective. A bifurcation always existed. It's more acute now. You know, marginal deals are going to get pushed to the bad side of this bifurcation, and good deals are going to get funded fairly quickly because they're, they're very rare. You know, the, good, the, the very definition of a good deal is higher. That's what creates this bifurcation. And you know, don't let a VC kid you. If a VC wants to do a deal, they can do it in two weeks um, from, from start to funding. I mean, we, you know, I, so I don't think that's a, a gating issue. I think the important thing for you and your use case is, is that you, don't, you got to know which bifurcated group you're in. And you ideally want to know that pretty, pretty soon you know, well in, well in advance. But if you go out and talk to 10 people and you're not getting a lot of enthusiasm, don't go out to the next 10, you know, because in this market especially, the chances of finding somebody that's going to fund gray are very, very small. They're going to fund white and not fund black, and that's it. I, th I think you want to figure out what the criteria is, because I've, what I've heard is happening to a lot of people is they thought if they got to this milestone, they could get their B. And what happened, is, and then this milestone, they could get their C. And what happened is the B moved to the C milestone. And, um, and you want to know that if that's going to happen to you right away. And even if you talk to a few friendlies, you might be able to kind of do a normal psychological kind of thing here where you get them to say, well, if I get to there, then would you fund me? And then there's kind of a psychological <coughs> peg there that later on you can come back and say, hey, I got to there. Because what's going to happen over the next few months of the economy continues to deteriorate this milestone will again move out again. So basically what people want to do is pay a lower price for, or pay the same price for lower risk or pay a lower price for the same risk, right? And so as a result, you basically want to figure out how to, you know, if they suspect there's going to be more risk in the market, they're going to make you hit a higher milestone or they're going to make you have a lower <coughs> price. So that's part of it. The other one is just be flexible on pricing. I mean, there's a group of uh, five, six Stanford guys I know um, who were out raising money and they had some really neat stuff and they had an amazing team and their expectations were just huge on valuation. And so I introduced them to a bunch of my buddies and they got meetings because they had a hot team and a hot product. Um, and, you know, they wanted like a double digit pre-money and it just wasn't going to happen. And and they told me literally one of them, finally the CEO came back and was like, you know, I, I, um, I'm like, what happened with that guy? He's like, oh, he didn't want to pay our price. And I was like, did you ask him what price he would pay? He's like, no. I was like, I'm like, <laughs> ask him. You know, and, and now you know what's happened is three months later the round's not done, and um, you know now he's he is probably at the price that guy would have paid, but he just didn't ask. So, well, one just encouraging comment to you: healthcare and medical devices is still, even in the public markets, holding up, and there's a lot of activity in the venture community in both spaces. We don't know how long this. Situation is going to last. Uh, do you see? I, I heard about you know keeping a small staff, key high quality people. You also look for you know not maybe temporary meaning people that can do work for you, but you really don't have the long term commitment, but you use them as you need them and kind of a like a part timer. Is that is that uh, a trend that you see? Or? I've never been a big fan of consultants or part timers. I, I just think startups move so fast that a 20-hour person spends 10 hours just catching up with what happened when they weren't there, and it's, it's just not worth it. Um, and, um, and, and consultants, basically for the flexibility, you massively overpay. You know, you'll pay the guy 100 bucks an hour, which is really 200 grand a year, when you could have got him for $50 an hour, you know, which is 100 grand a year full-time, and you probably could have gotten you know, 60 hours. And so th the math has just never worked for a lot of these kind of flexible models and consultants really get hit in downturns, you know, typically they get their utilization rates drop, you know, across the board. Um, 
But I, yeah, I, you know, you want a smaller group of people that are really dedicated and will stick through it, and stick through the tough times with you, because um, there's going to be some hiccup that you're not going to anticipate. Can I, can I maybe put a slight challenge to Munjal? I agree with his sentiment on consultants, but there are areas. An example would be interactive design. A group of engineers, there may be four or five, none of whom have done any interactive design. Go hire IDEO for $40,000 and get yourself a world-class interface. Don't cut corners on stuff that's going to make a major difference on adoption or friction. And I think Joe would probably agree with that. At the same time, a bunch of consultants make no sense, nor do part-timers in my opinion. But I do think there are a handful of areas that at times you want to go and hire an expert and you can't afford to bring in somebody full-time and encourage you to do that. And we use the job forum, the, I forget what they're called, but the internet forums to um, hire people for one-day jobs. Like, for example, and we'll hire four or five people because the economics are so stunning. You know, we, we have a gal out of Turkey that just is a terrific web designer that we pay all of us no money to. I mean, you know, that, that um, is, has been very reliable and very... Um, very high quality, quality work. But for anything strategic, you want to hire. Your team is, the value, is a key part of the value of your company. Don't use a consultant as your acting VP of marketing for any period of time, for example. Um, you're going to have a continuing need for marketing. Invest in, in, invest in the uh, real thing there. I think that's a good lead-in because I just like to leave, leave with one last question for everyone. Is from the space that you're in, what do you think is the most interesting area for someone, you know, for people in this room to be thinking about starting a company in for this, you know, in this type of economy for the next year? I mean, I think I've given some of the thoughts I had. You know, I'm like, there's opportunity in a downturn. There are new opportunities that didn't exist. Like, get creative and figure it out. If you don't have those ideas, literally I got a bunch. I'm trying to have somebody start. <laughs> Come see me. <laughs> you could start it and, you know, we'll take a small stake or whatever. But just, like, think creatively about what do people need in this current situation. Um, and, and there will be new opportunities that just didn't exist. Well, yeah, I think it, de it depends on your skill set if it's fungible or not. Um, in high tech, I think the, inter the, the Internet remains the – especially uh, from the perspective of being able to uh, reach cash flow break even very inexpensively. I think that remains uh, very attractive, even with uh, consumer spending down and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, if your skills are more fungible and you're just starting your career, uh, I can't help but to think that energy is, 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 a, is a major, major importance. The trouble with energy, and I'm no expert, but the trouble with energy is, you know, finding the right one. I mean, finding you know, and, and following the carbon trail and, and all that. But um, one, of the, one of the interesting businesses that I've, I've seen in, in that regard, and I, I'm not expert enough to know how successful it will be, is actually an enterprise uh, software company that started a, its business around um, carbon profiling of, of enterprises and, and showing enterprises how they can reduce their carbon profile um, and so on, and presumably they have this big website and all this automation. Um, but, you know, if we can fight all these wars and get men on the moon and stuff, we just got to get energy independent. And Silicon Valley is, has got to play a key role in it. Jim, you have the last word. Yeah, well, I, I would tell you that we don't have a specific sector we'd encourage anybody here to pursue. We want to hear about your great ideas and, and candidly think the broader landscape is open, especially if you're focused on needs, not wants, and are really getting after some of the things that both Bob and Munjal talked about. I just I want to reiterate, I think it's a great time to start a company. I'm hoping that at least one or two of you come see us in the next six months to a year, and more than that number, start something. And uh, don't let the environment become part of what you guys decide to do. There's right. nothing like doing a startup, you know. I mean, there's just nothing like it. Well, <laughs> flying an F-18 comes close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Well, I think, if, please join me. I think it's been a terrific panel. Thank you very much.